She went back to a flatmate going, I don't know what Mark does, but he's a pussy wizard because I couldn't stop orgasming, right? And all I did was raid my finger up and down a core, that's all. My name is Mark. I'm a male dominant. We run a place called Studio Kink in Sydney and we teach shibari, but all sorts of kink friendly and poly friendly ideas. We use um, Japanese jute. It's a natural fibre. Things that make this different to normal rope that you'd buy from the hardware shop is that it has what's called a low burn speed. So I can grip this rope and just drag it from my hand and absolutely not do anything to my skin. So if, if I was pulling this up underneath your armpit, if you used climbing rope or sailing rope, you'd rip your skin off. Like, it'd be like, ugh, right? Um, but it's also natural and it's twisted. So twisted rope vibrates. So if I put my finger, if I put my nail on this, you'll probably hear this. You can hear it vibrating. So when two ropes pull on another rope, they vibrate like a guitar string or a violin string. So it's like, in fact, when I do some Japanese performance with Japanese, I'll actually tie that way where it feels like I'm actually playing the instrument, right? And I, and, but I don't uh, imitate it, I just, I just allow my flow to work. So, so anyways, the rope is eight metres long. There's little knots. One is to help us join the rope, but actually what will happen is they'll actually, when I'm pulling the rope off, it'll actually get jammed underneath the other rope. And so I will get to a point where I'll actually play like a balance with the person where I'll start to pull back and they'll actually naturally pull the other way because they can't come towards me, they'll fall down. So it's sort of like, uh, uh, it's like waiting for the rope to pop. But it's like, tut, 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 pop. So you use the knots to pop, you use, um, the rope's always tied in centre. It's always used double, so it's always used doubled over. So if I was to tie someone's ankle, I just wrap it around twice like that and I've instantly got two bands or 25 millimetres or one inch of rope, which means it doesn't dig into me. And I don't have to tie it tight, I'd only tie someone's wrist about that tight. So I don't need to do anymore because the rope doesn't stretch, so I can't get it off my hand, I can't get it off. And it's silky smooth. But it does, well, if you bought this from a hardware shop, you'd buy what's called sisal. Sisal's actually grass, and if you did that to it, you'd have bits of grass in your skin, which feels like uh, splinters. The collar is a symbol, that's all. Right? So in the beauty scene, it's effectively like in the, if you're a vanilla and you put a ring on someone's finger, putting a collar on their, in their neck is a symbol of logic. It, just, it means that there's a connection between you two. What that connection is up to that relationship, right? So if you read the books, you're like, oh no, it means this, that means that. It means exactly what we want. And because now I've done this now for 20 years on a long-term poly, multi-relationship household where the girls are happy, the household's happy, you know, um, and we grow together. I'll give you a story. I have an um, Italian background. I have an 80, uh, my mother turns 88 next week, all right? She says to me, Marco, I don't know what it is, but when the girls are in the kitchen, there's no stress, everyone's happy. And for her logic, that is, I don't know what you're doing, because in her life, my poly life doesn't work, you know? But she goes, the girls are really happy. There's actually no, there's no, you know, and you'd see it. You'd see it in the kitchen, you know, when the family's over, you know? So for her, her logic is like, something, something's right about this relationship. She's like, I don't know what you're doing. And it's because everyone has their own value and power and, you know, and it's their choice. When, when Lani was first there, I'm like, I expect you to leave when you're ready. You know, 15 years later now, she's still here, you know, why? Not because she's forced to be, it's because she finds a happy place. My third partner, Lizelle, currently, when I first played her, I said to her, when I tell you, I said, you might orgasm. She told me later, and she tells the class actually now, and she goes, and I went home and I'm like, yeah, sure, buddy. Like, it's hard enough for me to orgasm on my own, let alone you're gonna make your orgasm without touching me, right? But she's like, couldn't believe what I did. And she goes, so she came back, she went back to a flatmate going, I don't know what Mark does, but he's a pussy wizard because I couldn't stop orgasming, right? And all I did was raid my finger up and down a core, that's all. But, but everything's about layering. If you prime someone, all right, and if you layer where I'm making her work hard and I know, well, she's got long hair like down to the bottom and one of the things I did was took her hair and put it around her throat and choked her with it, all right? And she's like, you know what? I've always fantasised about someone choking me with my own hair and no one's ever done it. And I never even told you and you did it first go, right? So it's the sort of thing where I'm like, 
I, I play very organically. I don't plan anything. I, it's based on the person, the time. And it was just like at that moment, she had her hair down. And I'm like, oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, the little twist. Uh, stigmas around the whole Buddhist community. Um, you know, you've got to consider that Shibari is very specific, but it's all part of the BDSM scene. Still medically, if you partake in BDSM, you're classified as being crazy and you can't consent to pain. You can't consent to being hit at all in Australia or in America, right? So, so not that they will usually charge, but it's still against law, right? So, so there's a huge stigma. But I mean, our last year's Mardi Gras parade, our theme for our float was keep loud and proud, right? Uh, and the year before was fetish, fierce and fearless. So, you know, so it's about actually, and the reason is because, you know, uh, being gay is out, but kink is actually kept generally under, under, under the, you know, not, not talked about, you know? So where in, in corporate Australia or corporate America, it's okay, you know, if you're gay, that's a good thing to talk about. I'm in construction when I'm not doing my kink stuff and I was building Westfield to Bondi and we got outed on the radio by 2UE in the afternoon and the head of construction at Westfield rang me up and said, Mark, you know the shit you do on the weekend? You're on the radio. So because I don't talk about it, but the people that know me know what I do, but it's not like I wave a flag going, you know, you know I don't wear a studio kink shirt unless I'm at the studio or doing something like this, you know? So yeah, there's a huge stigma. The music industry uses fetish imagery as the norm today, right? That just means that more and more young people get involved. And those young people eventually grow up and there's an open, open understanding. It's not somebody you can just go, well, it's time to accept us. It's not going to happen. But through ethical kink, people, if people are comfortable and go, you know what, you know, there are assholes out there, there are abusers out there, but not everyone's like that. And you know, if you consider that if we teach a thousand people a year, in the last five years we taught 5,000 people, if you just put the COVID effect on that and go everyone affects five, four more people, that's 20,000 people that we've taught about consent, negotiation, limits, you know, and even if they never come back to us, right, they still go out and have a particular standard of what they'll accept for themselves. That's, that's, that's positive. And that'll change the, the public perception. People with bad intent don't tend to come to our studio because I'm such a strong character. And that's why people feel so safe at Studio Kink, because bad people don't, don't feel comfortable to come because the space has got such a good reputation. And, and it's easy to see someone's attitude when you tie someone. We partake in Mardi Gras, we've got our own float, like, so we're, 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 we're positive towards the gay community, the queer community. So there's lots of girl girls or boy boys coming. So the, the, the space is really open. Those guys don't feel comfortable in that sort of space anyway. Those people who are like that don't feel comfortable, so they don't come. And people will say to me, oh, you know, Mark, you're a little soon, you know, well, you should out these people. And the problem is that the minute you talk about them, you actually add oxygen to them and you give them more profile. How you deal with those sorts of people is you talk to the other club owners, I'll go to like the owner of Hellfire and go, Craig, Jackie, just watch him. Just watch him, right? And, and that's how you deal with them. Because if you talk about them publicly, all these supporters will come out and go, no, you're a cunt, uh, uh, and then all it does is give them, you know, so I've learnt this 20 years in the scene, right? Yeah, you gotta be smarter, you gotta be smarter. Today, it's like we don't do with anyone. Well, I don't give anyone any oxygen at all. If someone's at us, we just make sure that the right people know. And then you let that weed them out, no problem.